I'm Anna. Uh, I was recently named as a Jump for Champion, and in my day-to-day -day life, I work as an architect at IBM. Um, I also enjoy, uh, well, I started as a Java developer, and slowly I have um, expanded my skills into other areas as well. And one of my, um, my areas, where, which I'm really founded for, for a few years, is the Kubernetes area. And I certified the second passion of mine with OpenShift and Linux Foundation certifications. Um, I'm really passionate about what makes uh, things better, what it can be improved, uh, of course, uh, about uh, development techniques, and um, also uh, to know how we can all make it better as, as developers. Some of my experiences are shared within the Bucharest Software Craftsmanship Community, which is co-founded together with my dear friend, Victor Renta. Um, in the talk today, uh, we're going to start uh, looking at uh, something very popular nowadays, um, and I'm speaking about distributed applications, because throughout the years, people have seen that just building uh, monolithic applications that are installed maybe on a very heavy to maintain application server is not, uh, is not an easy way to, to go, um, not just for the developers, but also for those that benefit from those applications. So for a few years, the world is uh, revolving around building microservices. And when you are talking about building microservices, you are probably choosing some frameworks because um, you're still building applications. And even in this pattern, you're building those mini applications that should be de independently deployed, but they are still having some frameworks um, at their basis. And of course, uh, you need to uh, have that application in a, give it a, a runtime, a place, an environment to, to, to run in. And that's when a Docker comes to help you. And then you're thinking like, hey, but I need a place to, uh, you know, connect all these Dockerized microservices. And that's where uh, Kubernetes uh, is adding up to this, uh, to this entire uh, situation. Yet, um, this uh, recipe of uh, frameworks, Docker, and Kubernetes is not something um, that um, a lot of people uh, would think of justifying all the time. So if you would ask somebody if we would choose something else, uh, there would be a little pause and probably some research involved. So why is Kubernetes so popular? Well, Kubernetes is so popular because it has a certain, um, certain features um, these were extracted from the Kubernetes.io website, um, and maybe some of you that are already familiar with Kubernetes and might have heard about it, might have worked with it, already are into the field uh, for some time, know that it provides all these goodies, and it pretty much tells you that it does a lot of things for you. So it, it does a lot of things automatically. It self-heals. Um, it can do some horizontal scaling. It can do the service discovery. It can balance your load. Um, it can manage your secrets and also the volume or the place that you want, you want to keep something of a, of a bigger size. So all these features uh, make Kubernetes the go-to um, orchestrator at this very moment, which is really nice. Um, and then uh, if you're just starting with microservices uh, and maybe you have built one or two just to try out how is that kind of architecture happening, um, or you're just really starting based on, you know, going to conferences, seeing some talks, um, you would know uh, that microservices are about the DVD tempera architecture. So you're building small applications. Uh, each of those are doing uh, their uh, specific business function. Um, it should, they should be deployed independently. They should be maintained independently. But all together orchestrated, they should work together and do a very, very important business aspect. Um, those being said, when it comes to making a microservice, uh, some of you have already tried and, of course, uh, it will start with some application code. Um, then we add to that, to that application code, we add some uh, Docker file because we need to um, create the Docker image that will be run by Kubernetes. Um, and then uh, we get to the point where we want to work with Kubernetes. Of course, we want to run that image somewhere in Kubernetes. And uh, when you get to this point, you are seeing Kubernetes like this very big and important box that is uh, running your things. And you know that for Kubernetes, you need Kubernetes objects, and you can describe them in a YAML format. 
Of course, you can work with imperative commands to create those in Kubernetes. It's nothing bad. It's nothing bad. But as developers, um, I think we would really like to be more like, okay, I want to keep this thing, uh, this command um, in so to be more my format, my code format. And I think a lot of you have heard about the term of infrastructure as a code. So really right now we would like to capture, I think at the level of, um, of our code base, uh, the information that are related to uh, an application lifecycle so that, I don't know, if something happens to an environment at some point, to just have it captured there. And if you're working with Kubernetes, you realize that you are um, working with uh, YAML files and you are probably going to start with writing one YAML file and then you add some more because your application needs some configurations or it shares some configuration or should share some configuration with others in the ecosystem. And then you add and you add some more. And sometimes if you're thinking like, hey, I just want to do it the easy way um, and I will uh, just write a very long um, file with everything that this application needs. And I've seen that they're also available on the internet. So whatever uh, is to be done to work, uh, to make your application work and to make it deployable, you would do that. So you write a lot of these things. And the question that comes after all doing this for one microservice um, or doing more for many more microservices, like on the long term, how many times would you actually be willing to do these changes? Because you also have to think like um, how you are optimizing your work um, when, uh, you know, interacting with uh, an orchestrator. So you would do it like, I don't know, for two microservices, for four, for eight. But your application and your entire distributed application is evolving. And maybe it's not evolving at this very moment and you don't know the scope for, I know, next year. But for sure, it will evolve. There is nothing that stays the same. So those being said, you do not know how things will be in the future um, and how much work will be in the future. But you, you need a way to manage that workload uh, in a more standardized way. So those being said, uh, Helm, the Kubernetes package manager is there to help you into automating a little bit of your work. So what is Helm about? Is about creating templates, having templates to um, ease your work with Kubernetes. So to um, boilerplate to you some information that um, you would have normally done with Kubernetes objects. But it's good to have them as templates so that you can manage and update multiple Kubernetes configurations those via those templates. Um, also, those multiple configurations, you want to deploy them as a single application. So you don't want to issue multiple kubectl commands because not necessarily you, but you don't want to put your pipeline to do that for all the time that you're trying to de deploy something um, in your environments. So Helm is offering you with via its client also this ability to deploy as a single application. And last but not least, you can parameterize for multiple environment support because they are templates. So this means you should be able to separate the values from the actual object itself. Those being said, let me show you how things are working um, with Helm. So this is a bit of a show time with the charts. Um, <clears throat> So I also have some uh, code for my, uh, let me just close all. Um, I've created some code for you. It's going to be available on GitHub. Uh, it can be downloaded and tried um, so you can work with it. So I've created a small microservice called Landmark, uh, which is managing um, those uh, interesting locations um, in that you could um, buy a ticket for, let's say. I've just made some locations um, by default. And this, these locations, I want to store them in a database. So it's pretty simple uh, like that. Um, and this landmark microservice is going to have its locations taken from a database, in my case, a PostgreSQL database. Now, if I would like to, um, to use this landmark code from here, which I, I used Quarkus for this one, um, I would need a Docker file first, right? Remember, like, to make a microservice, you need application code, you need a Docker file. So I will need a Docker file to make my image and so on. Now, the good thing about Quark is that it's already kind of giving me um, a Docker file. So that helps me to, uh, you know, not write from scratch uh, um, a Docker file. Uh, so that part is a little bit more uh, resolved with, uh, with this one. Um, next to that, um, I want to be able to create some Helm charts, right? So 
for interacting with Helm, most of the time you are installing a um, client called Helm, of course. And with this client, you can create your own charts. So by just issuing, uh, let me just go to the landmark part. So by just issuing Helm create landmark, you can create your own charts. Sorry. I already had this one. Um, Helm, I'm going to create it again. One. Okay. So let's see what this one created. Um, so when you're creating a chart, the other Helm create, which you get, you get uh, some, um, some things uh, already um, out of the box with it. So you get a values file. This is where your parameters will go to. And you get a charts folder where you can put your dependencies. So if you have dependencies or you need to install multiple charts at once, you can put them in the charts folder. And if you need to work with, of course, templates that describe that application in yours, uh, you would also get those uh, boilerplate. And Helm, uh, throughout its versions, has become better and better in boilerplating for you some, some Kubernetes objects. So you just need to add one or two things and everything's uh, going to be working for you like a charm. Um, so all these things here are called templates. And you can also have your own tests to test um, um, if your charts are working. Um, and this is pretty much a way to, to create and to describe and to deploy uh, the Landmark microservice. Now let's look a little bit more into the Landmark microservice because I uh, want to deploy it all together with my uh, PostgreSQL database. So what I will do, I will need to have the PostgreSQL as a dependency. This means that if I'm looking to my charts, and I'm going to the chart.yaml, which typically contains the description of what you're trying to deploy. Um, I see that I'm trying to deploy um, an app, um, a chart that's a, a leader called leader um, that is going to deploy uh, two things. One thing is going to be my dependency, the Postgres SQL one. Um, and afterwards, we'll actually, uh, it should take the, my, my application. So those being said, by listing the dependency, I can instruct Helm to, to do this like two-in-one thing uh, for my application. And uh, for the uh, part with the landmark, because the what I generated earlier, just uh, modified a little bit and copy-pasted here, um, I just copy-pasted it into the charts part so that Helm would know that we need to install everything that's under charts. Um, also, uh, the charts uh, situation for Landmark, well, you don't need to rewrite everything. So the idea of using Helm is that if you have the uh, value set here at this higher level next under the leader, um, you can define global variables that will be available throughout, your, um, throughout all the charts. And you can define uh, local variables at the level of, of a certain chart. So, for example, um, I don't need to re-instantiate or re-call uh, the uh, Postgres SQL details uh, because those are going to be automatically known uh, at my landmark uh, value. I'm just going to define that there should be a secret key taken into account that my Postgres SQL uh, password is in a secret. So, in this case, there's a secret shared between my Postgres SQL database and the landmark application. And um, if we're looking at a little bit further to the templates for the landmark, we have the deployment part where I'm just saying, hey, you should get from the environment. So I don't want to care when I'm working with my application. I don't want to care from where my configurations are coming. So uh, I defined a default uh, value just in case something is not out there. Uh, but in case something is out there in the values, that should be first taken into account. And um, by using this, um, just simple, very simple customization, I am able to, to work and in, in to install two things at once. Those being said, if we're going back here and just issue Helm install and just give it a name, um, and I'm going to say leader, um, this is going to install for me my um, my charts uh, for for this uh, for this particular case. So I'm going to have my Postgres SQL and my um, landmark available. So if I'm going to see kubectl get deployments, 
um, I can have, um, I'll be able to see that I got my um, leader landmark part. And um, if I'm going to go to kubectl get STS, I'm going to see that I have my leader Postgres SQL database defined here. Now, uh, when we're saying so everything's fine, seems to be have uh, snap to be installed and everything is looking great for us. So it's doing all two things at once. If we're looking to the situation of what Helm brought to us, it brought us as advantages the fact that we could easily prototype how we are going to install an application just by a few commands. Then we can separate the non-final values from the actual objects. So we don't have hard-coded things into the actual charts. Um, when you're going to look at the chart, you're going to see that some things are still like available as strings, as plain strings. Now, if you feel that that specific value is not going to change throughout your application changes uh, deployment cycle in, in the different environments, you can still have those there. But the good practice is like to have those values that you kind of feel that are going to change in time to have them separated from the actual object definition. Then you have the ability to deploy. So those many configurations, you can make multiple values files. So you can have values.qa, values.dev, values.production. Uh, those configurations um, can be taken into account and selected, by the way, um, via your, um, um, I don't know, your Jenkins or what you're using for, for, the, for orchestrating deployments. Um, and they can be picked up for a specific environment only. Um, so it's a great way to install all these configurations and all these objects that actually pertain to a single application uh, and to do it only, only once with only one command. So the Helm install command works for all the objects. You don't have to issue it multiple times. And then it gives you the ability to check in a template that if you have a value, like you saw that default value, so if there is something present, it will take it into account. If it's not defined, there's no problem. You should have the default present. Or you can check if something was defined. So there's, um, there are statements to check if uh, a variable is defined or not. Um, and to, or actually to go through um, installing or um, making a certain customization in Helm if um, a certain value is present. Those being said, if we go a little bit deeper, Helm gives us a little bit more than just templating. So it gives us um, some very cool aspects in terms of automatically rolling deployments via annotations. So this uh, the annotation is going to trigger the automatic deployment. Um, but there is another thing that you should know. Uh, the annotations, you can define the, so the checksum annotation. And so the checksum annotation can check if something has changed in regards to your secret or your config map. And um, if you've worked just with plain Kubernetes objects, you know that if you're changing the contents of a secret, your deployment is not going to automatically get triggered. It is uh, going to you know, expect some instruction to, from you to, to actually take, a, take an action there. And situations like this can, can happen. So you need to take into account, well, yeah, I need to do that, to restart that. Um, to tell that to restart because I changed my credentials. Then is the nice thing because you have the reusability encouraged uh, via um, include or TPL functions, and you can define your own templates in the already defined underscore helpers.tpl. So that's boilerplated for you, but you can furthermore create your underscore helpers.tpl. So uh, in the end, you don't end up creating kilometric templates that you end up um, creating manageable templates. And the fact that you can um, define smaller um, amount of files just oriented around what you are deploying and giving you a good overview of what you will deploy is a very, uh, very important aspect in, uh, in templating and in actually easing your, your uh, dev work. Last but not least, Helm can be instructed to keep resources upon an install. So if you want to uninstall a, a chart, and you don't want to feel bad that you've lost something. What you can do, you can choose how and to say to Helm to, hey, keep this for me. I want you to keep this resource for me so um, that is not taken away uh, when, uh, when the next uh, upgrade or the next uninstall is happening for me. So keep that for me. Um, so you don't lose any, everything that when an uninstall happens, for example. But last but not least, well, we're now looking to the question we had at the, in the beginning, like how many times would we be ready to do this? 
Um, and for example, if I would like to duplicate my efforts, like I did it for the landmark with the Helm charts, um, and I need to do another microservice that's also independently managed, the call, the, it's called social event service, and we'd also need a PostgreSQL database where it's going to have its information and status and so on. So what would I do in that case? Would I do it again like that? So would I could go ahead to create another Helm chart? Is, is that enough? Um, and there's again the question like, can you do this unlimited times? And here's the thing. If your system gets to a certain maturity, so it evolves, it becomes bigger, it has more microservices. And sometimes you realize that um, databases, for example, um, you can you might want to manage them differently. For example, as you saw earlier, the PostgreSQL database is uh, backed up actually by a stateful set object in Kubernetes. And if, for example, I want to increase the volume size of that sta um, of the, in that stateful set for the uh, volume claim template, just by using Helm, that's not going to be an operation uh, that could easily trigger um, an update on that uh, particular property of the object. So uh, those being said, um, you are looking probably in something that will abstract some of your operational work, right? And that's where the operators come into um, into the scene. So operators are packaging for you some um, um, human operational knowledge um, and you can package, deploy and manage Kubernetes applications, which was uh, basically um, most of the time having human uh, operational knowledge and um, encode that uh, into, into the software that, in, that is more easily packaged and um, it's easily shared with consumers. The great thing about operators is that you don't need to install another client. You can use directly kubectl or you can use even the dashboard that comes with Kubernetes so to interact with operators. Um, operators are secured um, and they use HTTPS. They're like any other Kubernetes resource. Um, they can be used to create um, backups or for configuring the clusters. And I'll tell you about the location where you can search for the available operators at the moment. Some of them are deprecated, some of them are not, but it's good to look into um, operators that actually can abstract some of the work that you would have manually done. So for example, if you have tried to um, upgrade um, a cluster before, you know uh, the steps that are needed to upgrade a cluster, you need that, you should back up your ETCD, um, uh, that you should look at the control plane, you should always be careful, um, and there are certain commands that need, need to be issued at that time. You can, you know, sometimes you have to take care about certificates, and this is not something, um, that you would like to do uh, very often, so why not automate it? Secondly, um, cloud native tools can be maintained via operators, and right now there's a multitude of, of tools uh, for working uh, with the monitoring aspect. So for example, for tracing, you have a Yager that can be installed as an operator, you have Grafana, you have Prometheus, so all of these can be installed via operators and maintaining them as, as Kubernetes resources is way easier um, than, than before. So what's next? Because we're, I mean, we're circling a little bit back to the discussion about uh, the, um, what, what would I do for my event service, right? What to do next? So first of all, I discovered that, well, I inspect the operator hub.io, uh, which is the place to go to see which operators are available at this very moment. And then I decided to use the Crunchy Data Postgres operator, which is pretty easy to install. There's some deployment instructions that need to be followed, but it's very easy to, to work with just by following their instructions in the GitHub. And then I still kept my Helm charts for my second microservice because I want to be able to, uh, at this moment, to still reuse some of the Helm charts um, and um, need to, to, to think of a solution for, for the, next, uh, the next parts. And I feel that Helm at the moment with where my um, uh, project is, uh, is fine for maintaining that. And then for the part with the PostgreSQL database maintenance, I'm just giving that to the operator. So I'm not uh, worrying myself to maintain that via Helm chart anymore. I'm just going with it to maintain it via an operator. Now to give you um, just a hint of what's going to happen next, um, you can create your own operators. So you can create your own operators by using Kudo, Cube Builder, Meta Controller, or Operator SDK. And in my case, I oriented myself with Operator SDK. 
um, because I wanted to, um, well, I could have chosen any of them actually, but if you are looking to deploy an application across a cluster that, and that application um, is to be configured in a particular way so that you achieve high availability throughout your cluster, then um, uh, you should think of creating an, an operator. Now, this is the final view that what's going to be built and also what you find in the GitHub repository. So uh, it's actually the ticket store uh, app where you can buy uh, tickets for either an event or a landmark. This is uh, the front end part. And to make it happen, of course, it has a Docker file associated, the ticket store, also the event service as well. Uh, well, to make it happen, the ticket store service, um, I firstly created the Helm threads because I know to work with Helm and then I created the operator. So the next part is about creating Helm charts and, and then creating uh, from Helm charts to going to operators. To, uh, you know, creating Helm charts, we've seen that, how to create them, how to maintain them. But the idea to make them available for creating operators, we should be able to publish those Helm charts. And Helm charts need to be published to a repository. Now, repository for Helm charts can be, um, can be different in, can be, um, I mean, a different place than just um, a normal code repository. What I went with, what is available right now, I mean, for me, it was available the, the GitHub part. And it's good practice to go with creating uh, GitHub pages um, and then just push your charts over there. So I just packaged my Helm charts for tickets. Uh, I call them ticket store. Um, then I moved my charts, the results for my charts, which is uh, an archive, to the docs. Uh, because the GitHub pages work um, with docs and they're going to look at the root of the docs. And I just index those docs um, with, with, a new, with the URL where I want to find my repository. So I will tell oh, actually the instruction of how things are going to, uh, um, where it's going to be reachable to, to get those charts of mine. I added my charts and then just git commit and push the usual uh, situation. Um, then to create my operator, I added to my, from my local, I added that um, repo of mine and I just called it store. You can give whatever name you like because that's your local name here. And secondly, I just created my operator in the folder called operator and just by using operator SDK init command, I was able to create my operator from the Helm chart um, from store uh, ticket store. So the ticket store one uh, available at the repo store. And that's pretty much it. So uh, let me show you the ticket store part. Uh, first, let me check if the Quarkus app is, yep, yeah, it's up and running. Oh, should be taking the events. So let me check this landmark. It would show up also the tickets part in the events. Double check it, but I must have some bad luck. Um, and last but not least, some takeaways for you. From for you, well, Helm has a custom packaging format. You've seen those templates that are actually in the Go format, um, and it, it had some structure. And operators also have a structure, but they include a great deal of complex configuration data in their package. So if you're looking to deploy an application and just to check if the deployment is going well, just going with Helm is a great way of, of working with that. Helm is great for deploying uh, any sorts of application. You've seen I could deploy the, the PostgreSQL um, database and also my stateless application. But if you're looking for a way to maintain your stateful application, um, I would recommend going for operators. Then uh, if you would like to deploy an application across the cluster so that um, or that cluster is, um, that your application needs to be in this particular way so that's available for everybody, um, then um, you should also look into operators. Um, and one great thing why Helm is, is also still an important point in evolving um, your, um, your deployment towards an operator for your application is because it has those annotations that can trigger automatic deployments. These are really cool stuff. Um, and uh, another cool stuff that you should think about is that operators bring to you the ability to um, have complex tasks like backups or a cluster configuration um, taken away from you. Um, those being said, this is where the code is available. Um, and of course, the slides will be shared. 
And that was it from my side.